Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Yes, You Can, Pathways to a Career in Dispute Prevention and Resolution. Today's program has been organized by the CPR Institute's Young Leaders in Alternative Dispute Resolution and the Metropolitan Black Bar Association's Alternative Dispute Resolution section. I'm gonna give it a few Dispute more minutes resolution. to let people come in. We have um, over 300 people registered for today's event. Um, so if you hang on um, for just about another minute, we'll get the program underway. So let's get started. Um, my name is Anna Hershenberg. I'm the Vice President of Programs and Public Policy and Corporate Counsel at the CPR Institute. My co-moderator is Lauren Jones. Lauren is the ADR Coordinator of the New York City Surrogates Court and the co-chair of the MBBA's Alternative Dispute Resolution Section, along with Jill Pilgrim. Hey, Lauren. Sorry, <laughs> I am. on behalf of myself and Anna, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's program. We would invite all of you to introduce yourselves as we've already begun to do in the chat, um, say where you are in your career and where you're zooming in from. As attendees are introducing themselves, we like to go over some quick housekeeping rules. Today's program, as you've heard, is being recorded. We're using the Zoom meeting platform to give everyone an opportunity to see each other and interact in the chat. So it's especially important that everyone keep their microphones on mute during the program. We encourage you to post questions or comments you have in the chat feature during the program. We'll try to get to them as we go. And for those that we miss, we'll catch at the end. We also have closed captioning enabled for anyone who would like to use it. We'd like to take this opportunity, opportunity to briefly thank our program co-sponsors, which include CPR Institute and its Diversity and ADR Task Force, MBBA's Pre-Law and Law Student Division and its Young Lawyers Division, the Association of Corporate Counsels, Nevada Chapter, the Greater New York Chapter of the Association of Conflict Resolution, and the New York International Arbitration Center. So before we begin the roundtable discussion, I'd just like to take an opportunity to say a few words about CPR's Young Leaders in Alternative Dispute Resolution Group, or YEDR, which is one of the co-organizers of today's event. YEDR is an affinity group uh, for the next generation of leaders in the ADR space. It's intended to be an incubator for innovative initiatives in dispute prevention and resolution, and a driver of CPR's efforts to expand diversity, equity, and inclusion in the ADR field and to make sure that we're deploying all of the talent available. It offers really unique networking and professional development opportunities, exposure to CPR's community of corporate counsel, law firm counsel, arbitrators, mediators, and academics, um, and an insider's view into how this community is using dispute prevention and resolution techniques in their practice. So if you're interested in participating in other events like today's events, if you want to share ideas and connect with like-minded people, we would love for you to join CPR's YADR LinkedIn page and to sign up to be a part of YADR. Um, we uh, are also really excited to announce that the application process for leadership positions on the YADR steering committee have opened up. Um, if you, you can see in the on the PowerPoint, there is a link there and We'll also be uh, circulating information about that in the meeting uh, follow-up email. So if Uliana, I, I think Uliana's on, um, if she's here, I'd like to turn the program over to Uliana Bardeen, 
of Evershed Sutherland, who is the co-chair of the YADR steering committee, just to tell you very briefly about the leadership opportunities available and some of the projects the steering committee is working on. Juliana, are you on? Okay, well, we can have Uliana come on towards the end of the program and, and, make, and make that announcement. So um, without further ado, I'll turn uh, the program back over to Lauren to, to kick us off. Okay, well, today's topic has generated a lot of interest. We are so excited to be here. As Anna said, we had over 300 people register and currently we have 130 people here and climbing. Um, as you can see from the chat, we have attendees here from all over the world and who are in all different stages of their careers. We have people who are working for the federal government, nonprofit organizations, people who are in-house and corp at corporations, people who are volunteer mediators, people who are working as solo practitioners and in small, mid-sized and large international firms. So we really run the gamut. We have college students, law school students, students getting their masters in conflict resolution, professors at universities and law schools. And everybody wants to know the same thing. What does a career in ADR look like and how do I get there? And we have a fantastic panel today that's going to be able to answer all of those questions and so many more. So after the round table, I just wanna let everybody know that we are offering a networking breakout sessions um, that will be organized by topic and led by facilitators. So we definitely encourage all of you to stay on for that after the panel. We're so thankful to have our accomplished panel here with us today because they will all speak in greater detail about their backgrounds and we provided links to their bios. We'll just provide very brief introductions. First up, Dina Eisenberg, who is the Ombuds and Senior Director of Global Ombuds Services at Twitter. Dina has over 20 years of Ombuds experience, including serving as an Ombuds in higher education and for corporations and designing and launching Ombuds programs in the high tech, IT and health tech spaces. Welcome, Dina. Thank you, Lauren. I'm, I'm super excited to be here um, and you know hear all the different paths that people have taken to their ADR careers. I'll just give you the 50 cent tour of mine. You know, I started my career in ADR as a lawyer my thing was prosecuting doctors for sexual misconduct, which was kind of a rough practice and very emotionally wearing. So I wanted to stay in a role where I was helping people and um, still use my legal background and training. So first I became a mediator and just been, did every job in mediation you could think of from case evaluator all the way up. <clears throat> then I decided my, I needed to have a private practice. So I opened up a conflict consultation company for 25 years. I helped variety, <clears throat> excuse me, com, kinds of organizations uh, learn about conflict, learn how to improve their conflict management skills and function as a mediator and facilitator. The way that I got to be an ombuds, because nobody, you know, at five says, I want to be an ombudsman, mom. Nobody says that. So the way that I got to being an ombudsman is that one of my consulting clients, a multinational bank, was merging with another large, large bank that had an ombuds. And my client felt like they wanted to have an ombuds who could help their folks transition through the merger and really make it successful because typically mergers are not that successful. And so that's how I first learned about the role. Uh, and became an ombudsman. And then I um, shifted, pivoted my private practice to being an outsourced ombud service company. So I worked with large organizations, law firms, and private companies, providing them outsourced ombud services. Um, for those who don't know what an ombuds is, it is a person who provides confidential, neutral, and informal resource for either employees, in my case, and some organizational ombuds to talk about work-related issues in a private way. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just quickly, into, Lauren and I will quickly introduce the rest of the panelists and then invite everybody to answer the same question uh, and give us a little bit more of a background um, of their pathways. So the next panelist we have up is Deborah Enix Ross, who is the senior advisor to the International Dispute Resolution Group at Debevoise and Plimpton. 
Um, Deborah has held executive leadership positions all over the world, including at WIPO's Arbitration and Mediation Center in Geneva, Switzerland, and at the ICC International Court of Arbitration in Paris. Deborah also served as the Director of International Litigation for PricewaterhouseCoopers and served on the NAFTA Advisory Committee on Private Commercial Disputes. Hey, Deborah, nice to see you. Thank you, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I was thinking, who did all of that? But uh, uh, I guess it's me. I guess it means I'm getting older. Nice to be here. <laughs> so great to see you. We don't call it older. We call it seasoned, right? Seasoned. <laughs> um, next up, we have Tajay Gaynor, uh, who is the director of the Westchester and Rockland Mediation Centers of Cluster which provides dispute resolution services and training to residents, businesses, and community organizations. Tajay also teaches students conflict resolution skills and was the Association of Conflict Resolutions First Diversity and Equity Director. He was appointed to the Criminal Justice Advisory Board in Westchester County by County Executive George Latimer. Welcome, Tajay. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Next, we have Erin Leeson Alvarez. Erin is an attorney, an arbitrator, and a mediator. And we're happy to say she's part of CPR's panel of distinguished neutrals. She is also the founder and CEO of Take Charge Negotiations, where she teaches negotiation theory and focuses on how to negotiate mindfully. Prior to becoming an independent neutral, Erin spent 10 years as the global head of ADR programs at AIG. Hey, Erin. And last but certainly not least, oh, were you gonna say something, Aaron? No, no, just <laughs> Last but certainly not least, we have Pete Swanson, who is the chief practitioner in the Office of Conflict Management and Prevention at the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, which is an independent federal agency that provides mediation, conflict prevention, and conflict management services for the private, public, and federal sectors. Throughout the course of his career, he has provided mediation training, facilitation, dispute systems design, and leadership development to more than 50 federal, state, local, governmental, and international agencies and organizations in 23 countries. Pete is also co-chair of the CPR Institute's Government and ADR Task Force. Okay, so that is the esteemed panel that you have before you um, that we are thrilled to hear about. And as you know, for registration, everyone was asked to submit a question. The number one question by far that we received that you wanna hear from the panelists is, walk everyone through your career path. Dina already began to do that. Um, how did you get to where you are today? What motivated you to choose a career in conflict resolution in the first place? Um, so Dina, if you have anything else you'd like to add to your um, story, you can please feel free to do that now. And then after that, we'll go to Deborah. You're on mute. All right, now I get the red nose for not remembering to unmute. Um, I'll just say that it, being an ombudsman is a great career and it really suited me because I'm the curious sort. I like to solve problems. Uh, and I like to help people. So if those are things that are interesting to you, you might think about pursuing that career. I guess I'm, I, I'm next. So when I saw the question, how did you get where you are today? I could give you a one word answer and that would be perseverance. Mm. Now let me explain a bit about that. Uh, and I don't mean the kind of perseverance that took me from being first in my family to go to college or the first in my family to get a postgraduate degree. We can talk about that another time and there is a certain kind of perseverance for that. But I mean, in terms of the, my legal career and where I am today, senior advisor to a Deborah Voice in Clemson, uh, I just wanna remind people that it took me seven years to get my first job in international arbitration. Uh, seven years from the time I graduated and was admitted to law school until getting that first job. Now I didn't sit around those seven years and, and not work because I'm not that privileged. So I did other kinds of positions. I started my career as a legal services lawyer 
Uh, and that gave me invaluable experience, including being on the negotiation team for uh, the, the union. And through each job that I took after that, it, I now know that it was building towards the first job that I got in international arbitration, which was to be the US representative to the ICC Court of Arbitration. And for those who are involved in international arbitration, you will know that the ICC is one of the premier uh, arbitration institutions. So I would say that, uh, you know, in all those years working towards that goal, I never lost sight of the fact that I wanted to be involved in international law. I wasn't quite sure it was international arbitration at the time, but everything that I was doing led up to that. And so that's one of the, one of the tips if it, if, that I could impart is that as lawyers in particular, no matter where we are working, all of the skills that we are, are using will put us in good stead for uh, future work and for a future role. So starting as a litigator, makes sense and then you become uh, litigation can lead to arbitration and mediation. Uh, and so that's what I would say. Uh, I know we'll come back and do some, uh, have, have a more fulsome discussion and I don't wanna take from others. Perseverance is how I got where I am today. I think that's so impactful. I mean, perseverance and um, the fact that you were willing to not waver off of your goal for seven years um, mm -hmm. to keep on track for where you wanted to go, I think is important for everyone to hear, um, particularly those young law students that are wondering, you know, how long does it take to get your first job? It may not take seven years, but it can. And look at what happens if you don't, if you don't waver, right? That's, that's how you, that, that is the walk, that's your particular walk to your career path. And I think that's very um, impressive. Um, Next up is, um, let's go with Tajay. Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, for me, it, uh, I feel like I was sort of destined to be uh, in ADR. Um, my path was maybe not unique, but it was interesting, right? So I got my first, um, or I was involved in my first training when I was 12 years old um, in New York City. Um, so I became a peer mediator. And, um, you know, it was kind of, it was interesting because I was one of those young people that um, people would say I had the gift of gab, but I also got in a lot of fights, right? I mean, it was the community I came from. And so um, that's sort of how we defined who we were, you know, in respect to everybody else. Um, but I also recognized that, you know, there were a lot of things happening in my community that um, needed to shift. Um, so, you know, I took this uh, peer mediation training because I had a teacher who said you'd be good at it. And um, I did, and it just made sense to me. It made sense because I understood conflict. I understood how we were impacted, how um, you know people in my community, mostly back, black and brown, um, were hurting each other. You know, as I started to get a little older, I started losing friends to violence, um, and I think that really solidified my interest in learning more about conflict resolution. Um, uh, by the time I was around thirteen or fourteen, I started working with the adults who trained me and um, going to other schools, teaching young people, um, started doing um, some, some work nationally and uh, getting involved in membership organizations um, like the Spider who no longer exists, but um, Spider and a couple other organizations merged and became ACR National. Um, and I was fortunate to have adults who recognized that young people needed to have a seat at the table and um, just started out from very young, uh, making sure that, um, you know, young people had a voice and, um, and we had the opportunity to show that leadership can come from youth as well. Um, so that's really my start. And then, you know, as I got older, I just, you know, stayed with conflict resolution. Um, you know, after college, I had uh, the opportunity to start working for uh, the Westchester uh, Mediation Center, where now the Westchester and Rockland Mediation Center. Um, and I started taking trainings through the um, CDRC network um, CDRCs are community dispute resolution centers, um, and um, you know had some great trainers like Duke Fisher, who's known uh, Lynn Hurdle Price, um, a couple of folks I saw on here, Homer Larue, who was a great mentor to me through Spider and then ACR, 
Um, you know, so I've, I've been fortunate, you know, I tell people I have almost 30 years, you know, I'm 41, but I have about, you know, almost 30 years of experience, um, not only connecting with people, but doing great work. Um, I'm a strong, strong believer that, um, you know, this work starts in the community. Um, so really grassroots and that's, that's the work I always wanted to do. Um, continuing to work with young people. That's my way of paying it back. Um, training adults who want to volunteer and serve in their community. Um, finding ways to really help our communities grow and heal, um, you know, given the trauma that we've experienced. So, you know, I live in the Bronx, I continue to do work in the Bronx, but I serve Westchester and Rockland counties. Um, and, uh, you know, the work we do is, is so important, particularly in this day and age, in this time right now. Um, so finding ways of helping people have the difficult conversations they need to have and figure out how we move beyond some of the challenges as a community is so key and important to me. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe my story is a little unique, but my, my path is what it is. Um, I'm very much invested in community work. Um, and so, you know, I had the, the opportunity five years ago to become a director of a CDRC after, you know, putting in 10 years of work um, in the organization. Um, so in, in some ways, you know, I guess that position was meant for me. Um, I, I think I was one of the youngest, um, CDRC directors um, at the time. And so um, for me, it's, you know, figuring out how to sort of create the path for other young people like myself who are interested in doing this work. I know sometimes it could seem challenging, right? And doors, you know, sort of get shut in your face and, uh, you know, um, people may not always see the, the, the possibility of sort of making a living doing this work, but it is possible. And it really starts with your passion um, it starts with um, knowing where you want to be um, and being that squeaky wheel, right? Because we know the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And um, so, uh, you know, my job now is figuring out how to grow that work within communities and create opportunities for other people similar to myself as I move forward. I, I mean, so, so you know, Deborah's word, if there's a word, perseverance, I think destiny and destined, Tajay, is, is certainly one that resonates with you. Unlike Dina's story where she said, you know, I wasn't seven years old. I wasn't a young child and woke up and knew what I wanted to do. You actually did. You walked this path for 30 years, like you said. The community-based experience that you had really played a unique role in, in shaping um, who you are and your involvement in mediation and what and your growth. And, and interestingly, you know, you you put in that time at your same company. Sometimes that's a lot of things that younger folks don't want to do. Um, put in 10 yeah. years, actually climb the ranks. You did that and it paid off for you. So that's um, I think that's really laudable and again, a different lesson that our audience can take away in terms of a career path, a different career path. And and you're not a lawyer, right? So this I'm is not another a lawyer. This is another example of a path that you can take from grassroots all the way up through as being an, as a non-lawyer, um, which I think is, is also really impactful for those of us in the audience. Um, okay, um, next up, let's go with Erin. Thank you. Um, and I love hearing everyone's stories. Um, and I relate to a lot of it. I think that, you know, if, if I was thinking of a word, as I think Deborah, um, had suggested, you know, for me, it, it's just always trying to maintain a sense of self and, and what's important to me and have a, a firm understanding of, of where I want to go and why. Um, you know, so I've been a lawyer for 20 years now, um, about 21. And, <laughs> and um, I graduated from uh, CUNY Law School here in New York um, in the year 2000. Um, after that, I was a litigator for about five years and uh, worked in first a really small law firm and then I went to a really big one and um, neither of them were really the right fit for me. Um, I felt that if I was going to be engaged in disputes work, that it made sense for me to be in-house because that's where the problems start and that seemed like it was probably where the most opportunity to, to do things that are creative and, and helpful and proactive would be. Um, but I knew that wasn't going to be sort of an overnight, um, you know, sort of a switch. So I um, had the luxury of, um, you know, applying to the Strauss Institute at, um, at Pepperdine and being accepted and then having the ability to sort of pick up and move across country and, and do that. 
And that was game changer for me. And, um, and it was such just a, a wonderful experience to, to be in that environment and, and to learn there. Um, so I actually, um, I don't really know how to drive a car. So I couldn't actually stay in California for a tremendous period of that, or a very long period. Um, because that just wasn't working. So, um, so we came back to New York and, um, and I had been working, actually, I, I did my externship at JAMS when I was in LA and, um, and worked for wonderful mediators and arbitrators who told me, you know, um, if you're gonna go back to New York and you wanna work in-house, you should really talk with the people at AIG because they have more disputes than anyone. And this was in 2007 <laughs> before everything changed. Um, so in fact, I was, you know, uh, I did go to AIG and, and stayed there for 10 years. So before, during, and after the financial crisis um, and sort of rose through the ranks while I was there. And, um, and it was wonderful. I mean, it was a great experience and, and I learned a lot, but, you know, at the conclusion of my sort of 10 year anniversary, realized that I had done what I needed to do. And I knew that, you know, the path for me was, was to be a mediator, an arbitrator. And I was not interested in waiting another, you know, 20 or 30 years, like the template often tells you, you should do. Um, so, you know, I mean, I had the I had, you know, sort of the, the ability to, to be in every bar association and conference and everything and listen in on all of these conversations and, and knew that at the conclusion of sort of my 15 year tenure as a lawyer, that it was time to, to make a shift. So towards the last couple of years that I was in house, um, I started working on my business plan and trying to get an understanding as to what life is going to look like if I really do this, you know, um, and and we'll talk, I think, in a little bit about the the sort of feedback that that I think we all have received in our respective paths. And I, for one, you know, it, every stage of, of my path um, was certainly told that that's not going to work. Um, and, and that was the refrain when I said that I was going to, you know, sort of go and put out my shingle and become a mediator on my own. Um, and so, you know, I, I anticipated that my first year of practice, um, I would make no money. Um, I did not think I would have any cases. And I assumed that it would be like sort of a slow, um, you know, progression of cases, hopefully thereafter. That's what people say happens. Um, thank God that is not what my experience was. Um, so I got my first case after I left two weeks out and it's been consistent since. And um, so, you know, the, the thing that, that I think is, is most important um, is, is really having a clear sense of what you want to do and why and, and, and being true to that. And there are always going to be people at least there have been for me, who say, no, you can't do that, or you're not the right person to do that, or you're not ready, or you're not good enough, or whatever. Um, and, and I have fortunately been able to sort of program myself not to listen to that, and to know that, that you know, that kind of advice is, is from a place that, you know, is not where I reside, and so I'm not going to listen to it. Um, and if I had listened to any of that, you know, I wouldn't be here with all of you today. So um, anyway, I, I am humbled to be here um, and I really appreciate you including me here. So, um, so I'll stop now and, um, and turn things over to, to Pete. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, everybody. This has been fascinating to hear. I'm, I'm, um, loving what I'm hearing about everybody's journey. Uh, hello, everybody out there. Um, you know, if the number one question was, how do I make a living in this field? I, I, I want to present to you kind of two sides, and I'd be curious what other people feel about this as well. But this is just my observation uh, about my own journey. And that is that in some ways, there's a lot of stiff competition. There's a lot of people in this world who want to do this work. There are many, many, many people who get themselves trained as mediators and say, boy, I would love to do this work. And I've contributed to a lot of that training for those people and raising those expectations all around the world. And it's not just here. It is everywhere you go. People have a passion for this work. 
there are two problems. One is that there's not a big market for this. There's not a recognized market for conflict. People don't pay for conflict to have people mediate. That's just a reality I've experienced generally. Um, there's lots of people who want to who want to provide the service, but there's not the people who are going to pay for it in the recognized way. And again, that's everywhere I've worked around the world and every country that I've worked in to help them create either a commercial mediation system, a court referred mediation system, you end up having some form of <laughs> mandatory mediation in some way to even get people in the door to try it because people want their day in court. And, 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 and it's really interesting when you go around the world and you hear people say, well, we do mediation. Well, nine times out of 10, what's actually happening is some sort of advisory arbitration where what you have is an elder come in and hear a case and that elder is usually a male who will then give you a, a, a judgment uh, in traditional uh, uh, ways of looking at mediation. It's, a ve it's very different. And so when you think out there, you wanna make a living in this field, what I can assure you with, of is that you can do this. You can make a living and you can make a good living in this work. What I found is the key to doing that is do not be attached to calling yourself a mediator or an arbitrator that's gonna lock you in because there's only a set demand for that. And until culture changes around the world or cultures change around the world to make this more of an accepted practice, you're gonna be stuck competing with people who are gonna do this for free, right? And so the, 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 and of course there are exceptions. I know I'm generalizing, but what, what I have found is I think our field gets in its own way an awful lot. And we limit ourselves by really focusing on the conflict. When the conflict is the pointy end of the spear, the conflict is what happens as a result of things not going well in some kind of relationship. And I found that the, the people who make a living at this work broadly in the field of conflict prevention, conflict management, conflict resolution, are those people who don't define themselves as mediators. As a matter of fact, that's a word that many people don't even wanna hear. They don't want mediators coming in, right? But if you associate our work with human connection, everybody yearns for that. There's a huge market for that, right? And so if you think about how do we help people connect better, then all of a sudden your world opens up and the possibilities for what you can do if you're not attached to being labeled as the mediator or the arbitrator or X or Y, you'll have more work than you can shake a stick at. Um, that that's and 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 I say that because I'm not an attorney. Uh, I was I've been mediating since 1986, so I'm in my 36th year of mediation. I was one of the first um, attendees when the field was young at George Mason University, and they had that that first program in conflict management. I was in their second class, and I was lucky enough in the class to have a friend who worked at the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. When I graduated, I turned to him and I said, what do you do with this degree? How can I get a job? Because I have to support uh, you're getting married. I have to support a family. What do I do? And he said, you know, Pete, why don't you come talk to us? I have a job for you. And there you go. I just, I just walked into a, a United States federal agency that did this for a living. And for the next 12 years, I really soaked that up and learned the ropes of what it was like to professionally operate in the field. And then in 2000, I left. And I started like uh, Dina, my own firm I had for 18 years um, where I didn't have a salary. I had to support the family just on what I could do on my own with this work. And that's where I really learned um, that if you, if, if, if you want to be successful in this field, you've got to think outside, think creatively about what the service is that you're offering to people and connections sold much more than conflict and really broadened my ability. I, it led me into coaching. It led me into a lot of leadership development, which is something you don't have a conflict in a company without some impact from leadership. And that is a huge piece that our field doesn't pay attention to, but that's an area of huge growth. When you look at culture, you look at leadership, you look at coaching and you blend it with facilitation and mediation and systems work, boy, there's a lot there. And then uh, two years ago, I was asked to come back to the agency to lead the old department that I grew up in. And so I decided, OK, I've had enough, a good run. Uh, I'll come back and I'll work for the agency. And so I now lead that group. 
And the big effort that I'm doing in our agency is to say, we need to turn our ship around and turn our mediators into more than just transactional. Let's get the settlement. Let's become really full service conflict management professional prevention uh, specialists. And so that's the program that um, we're highlighting. And it's a two year program that we're, we're uh, that, that we've launched and we're offering to our mediators to make them really full service uh, practitioners. So sorry for droning on, that's my, my spiel. No, thank you. Thank you, Pete. And, and thank you, Erin, um, since I didn't get to thank you after you gave your path. Um, just to kind of recap, you know, Erin, your, if I have to sum up your path, right, it sounds like you, you were really looking to break the template, um, whether you were doing it consciously or unconsciously, you heard that, what, I'm supposed to wait online for another 10 or 15 years, to, that's because that's what you prescribed to me. I don't buy that. I'm going to go out and use my own self-confidence and, you know, have focus on your own clear direction that you had to chart your own path. And yes, I cough that you don't drive, um, but you had enough confidence to change mid-career almost. <clears throat> you were already in one direction for 15 years or so and you pivoted and that takes a lot of guts because a lot of people don't have that and some people in our audience are mid-career and some people are wondering can I really just pivot you know when I might have a family or I have I you know what about what will people think um will people tell me yes or no or be supportive and you said look blinders on I'm gonna go with what I have I believe in myself and go to where I believe I should go and that you know that's really awe-inspiring I think um and Pete you you um you know, I think two things that came out of what you said were really powerful. One, people are always wondering, there's a lot of law students in here wondering, well, how do I get that first job? You know, I might get this degree and what do I do with it? And you said, look, I opened my mouth. I talked to friends. You know, I, I said, this is what I want to do. What do I do with it? And lo and behold, somebody helped you. You know, I always joke when I speak to people and I say, your network is your net worth. And you did exactly that. You used your network and you capitalized on that. And thankfully you had a friend in the right spot. Um, and another line you said, which was interesting, was connection sells more than conflict. I love that. Um, I think that's really that's really powerful, particularly where we stand right now in current day. Um, but even as marketing, you know, I've seen some some posts in here talking about marketing tactics, and I think that that's really important to remember. Um, at the end of the day, nobody wants conflict. If, if people want connection. People want resolution, and you tapped into that, and were able to obviously build a successful career. So, um, thank you, our five panelists, for sharing your career path about you know generally how you got here and what motivated you. I think they were really um, powerful. And now we can switch gears to our next topic. Yeah, th <clears throat> thank you. I echo what, what Lauren said. It was it's so interesting. You each have such a unique perspective and you've taken such a unique path, but there is something you know that kind of is threaded throughout each of your stories, which is that you were told no. And I think that as young, when we're younger, we kind of idealize people who are in your positions, you know, right now. And we sort of think, well, I'm getting told no, so there must be something wrong with me. Um, and these people that I, that I see and, and I admire, they probably just walked into, you know, into that job. And that's not true. And I think hearing about specific examples of how you each overcame, you know, being told no, like Tajay said, getting doors shut in your face. Um, uh, Pete, Pete had to shift to, you know, connections for the conflict. Like, what are some, can you each share, like, just maybe one or two examples of when you were told no and what you did to overcome that. Um, let's start with Dina. Yeah, I, I'm laughing because um, the story, I think it's just so unusual, but it definitely resonates with how to deal with the no. So when I had my consulting firm and I was beginning to want to talk to more companies about uh, ombuds work and just doing conflict work in general, I identified what industry I wanted to be in because to everyone's point, nobody wants to pay for conflict, but everybody want, likes the resolution, but they particularly like it when you are knowledgeable about their particular industry. So I wanted to be in the financial services industry and I picked out a bank that I thought had enough volume in terms of employees that would work. And literally, I called them every month to say hi. And at first, they're like, no, just not, no, not something we're doing right now. I'm like, fine, you, you will be doing it. And I called them every month for two years. 
At the end of two years, I convinced the HR leadership to give me an audition to do some training work for them and talk about growing out their mediation and ombuds programs. I did the audition. Uh, and did not get paid for it, but it looked like the opportunity was going to be so great and long standing, it was worth the investment of my time. And once we completed the audition, we began a multi year contract together. So they went from saying no to we find you to be indispensable to our goals around people and leadership. And, you know, we want to spend years with you building out a mediation program, considering an ombuds program. So just because someone says no right now, I always hear that is no right now, not no forever. It's just no right now. <laughs> I, I love that. I have to start thinking about that in my life too. Just know right, just just right now. So, so how? What gave you the sort of courage and the drive to to keep asking? I mean, a lot of people might be intimidated with the idea of calling, you know, once a month for every two years. How, what about you? What about you made you do that? I think I um, I'm really just determined, right? When I decide something should happen. I'm not going to be put off by the obstacles that come in the way. I was very, very lucky that the executive I was calling, his assistant was a sweet woman. You know, we got to be friends and eventually she said, if you want to talk to him directly, let's see how to make that happen. And she told me exactly when to call so that no one would be around and he would have to pick up the phone himself. And that was what made it worthwhile. It wasn't like I felt like I was doing it on my own. I felt like I had this partner who also saw the value of what I wanted to bring. And she was working just as hard as I was to get me to the leader I needed to talk to. That's also another really good point. You know, just everybody who you meet in your life, <clears throat> whether it's in school or just anyone, you know, you just, just be kind and nice to them because people will come back into your lives at many different points when it's unexpected. That's something I found. So Dina talked a lot about the perseverance and Deborah, that's the word that you use to describe how your career path has been. So I think it's a natural segue to go over to, to you to talk about a time that you heard no and what you did about it. Yeah, so before I talk about the specific uh, instance, I just want us to understand that no is not is always a direct no. Sometimes no shows up in what feels like advice, but is really a no. Uh, and it, what it reminds me of my mom who grew up in South Carolina used to say the difference between Southern and Northern racism, right? Because Southern racism, they tell you to your face, you can't come in here. Northern racism would be more, oh, well, we would love to rent to you, but we just that place is now not available. So it doesn't seem like a no, but it is. Uh, and so I, and there have been many instances in my life where people have tried to give me advice to steer me away from what I wanted to do. And if I had believed them, it would feel like advice, but really what it is, uh, it was a no. But my specific uh, necessary no is actually, um, I think in, in some ways funny, but also indicative of this profession. And it was that, remember I, to, I told you it took me seven years to get my first job in international arbitration. And it was as the American representative for the ICC Court of Arbitration. The ICC Court is based in Paris. So the day I came home and told my husband I got a job and guess what, part of my job is I have to travel to Paris. It was like, pinch me. Could this really be real? People are gonna pay me to go to Paris, fine. So off I go on my first big trip and I was meeting with American lawyers who were based in Paris, uh, who were a part of the arbitration community. And my job uh, was to get this committee up and running and to appoint arbitrators. So I had to meet all of these people who at that time, so I graduated from uh, law school 40 years ago, and this job would have been, say, uh, late 19, 1988. So in 1988, I go off to Paris, and I'm going to be meeting with this group of ar uh, arbitrators. Now, this is before internet and, and, you know, all the modern communication. So, I mean, we were using telex to set up the meeting. 
uh, and I go to this uh, a place. It was a uh, private uh, club because that's what everybody did in the 80s. And, uh, and I spoke French and I thought I was fluent and I was so excited going to my French. And I go to this club and I get to the door and I announce in French that I am there to meet with the name of the person uh, for this meeting. And I'm saying this in French and they said to me, no. And I thought, gee, my French must not be as good as I thought it was because I'm saying the time, I'm saying the date, I'm saying the person, I'm supposed to have a meeting. And the guy says to me in French, yeah, I know, I understood you, you can't come in. Now I'm, it's, it's, a, it's the classic for me, is this because I'm black or because I'm a woman? And it turns out it was because I was a woman. So I guess I felt relieved that, you know, it wasn't one form of discrimination, it was another. And that's because this was a private club. It was a male only club. Uh, and the men that with whom I was meeting hadn't thought about, they had just had never had a woman. So they didn't know that that was a problem. And I could have taken that no and walked away. But it, I remembered that it had taken me so long to get this position that I decided, the guy said to me, now I can take you up through the kitchen, through the back area. The reason you can't come in is because in the front staircase, this grand staircase, apparently they have portraits, nude portraits, not pornographic, but you know, sort of the classic Rubin portrait. And they thought women would be offended. So I said, okay, I went around the back and you could never be so surprised to see there's a group of men sitting at the table. I come in through the back and say, I'm Deborah Trust. I'm here to meet with you. And they said, why did you come through the kitchen? Well, because this is a male only club and I can't go down the main steps. Anyway, we had a great meeting and in solidarity with me, all of the men afterwards said, we're going down through the back way also. Uh, and they never held a meeting there until that club uh, admitted women. So it was a no, and it was a no that I hadn't expected. Um, I thought I've arrived. This is this is my 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 big moment. Um, but I think it was a teachable moment as well. And so that's just one. I mean, uh, but but as I say, I think it's one that describes what it was like to be in international arbitration in the early 80s, there weren't a lot of women, there weren't a lot of people of color. Uh, and so those worlds collided. That story is incredible. I mean, it's like, it's actually a literal door shutting in your face. Um, you having to go in through the kitchen, like the back way, but you got there and then you changed the narrative once you were there they left the same way that you came in and they never held another meeting there. Yeah. That's pretty inspirational, Deborah. Yeah. So, so I'm going to go to Erin now because Deborah talked about um, hearing advice uh, that's supposed to be advice that's helpful, but really it's just a veiled way of, of discouraging you for many different reasons, racism, sexism, so many other ones. Erin, I, I know that you've experienced that as well um, as you've been trying to climb the ranks um, in the, this space. Can you share a story about one of those times? I could write a book, um, <laughs> but that'll be when I retire, when I can actually publish it. <laughs> um, you know, for me, you know, I went to CUNY Law School. I was a plaintiff side employment lawyer in my first years of practice. Um, I went to CUNY because it was a civil rights law school. So I learned property law and torts through the lens of, of civil rights law and which, you know, it has been my compass all the way through. Um, I was told in no uncertain terms that, you know, I was always going to work in small firms. And, you know, that was just sort of the, the fate of people who made the choices that I did. You know, I wasn't going to go and work for a like white shoe firm. Um, but then I did that. And, um, and then I was told, you know, um, and once you're in there, you know, I, I wasn't as pedigreed as everybody else. Um, so there were going to be a lot of limits on it. 
Um, and I'm, you know, I just have always struggled with patience. I did think that that was going to be sort of a battle for me to, to sort of move um, in, in that kind of a place. So that was why I took myself out of the law firm world um, and went to Strauss. When I got to Strauss, I said, you know, I want to work in arbitration. Well, we don't do arbitration externships. There's, there's nothing like that available. Um, I ended up working for the founder of the arbitration practice at JAMS for a year and a half after that. Um, you know, people at Strauss don't really go on to in-house positions. That's, you know, uh, people tend to start up their mediation arbitration practices afterwards, so they go to a law firm. You know, so I got the job at AIG and, and survived AIG through some of the most harrowing years that I think any of us could possibly imagine. Um, you know, at the age of, you know, whatever I was, I don't know, like it's been like 42, I guess, maybe 40, something like that. Um, uh, you know, that's when I launched my mediation arbitration career. Um, you know, nobody does that. Um, I taught law school classes, despite the fact, everything, like the whole time, anything I ever wanted to do, um, everybody told me no. And they specifically told me no, because either, you know, I wasn't pedigreed enough, I wasn't old enough, I was too blonde, um, I did not wear business suits, I did not dress like a man, so men were not going to listen to me, or I didn't dress enough like a woman. But there's absolutely nothing that, that I could possibly do that was right. So I just turned it all off and decided I was just going to be myself. And like the rest of you can just, you know, kiss off. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, but I did want to give a plug to my friend, Damali Peterman, who is not here today, um, who was going to join us originally, but had a conflict. And, um, and you know, I love that that we sort of found each other in these ADR circles and, and have become friends and colleagues. And, and one of the things that, that we talk about often, both of us being you know, neutrals and both of us having our own sort of negotiation consultancy companies as well, um, is that you know, we don't, and I'm, I'm gonna go back to some of your comments, which I, um, which I do sort of disagree with, um, but this is just coming from my own perspective, Peter, or Pete, sorry. Um, you know, I don't think that either of us really feel that that there is this sort of sense of competition. Um, there is an artificial one. I think that people try to sort of sort of put that on you. Um, I, I don't feel competitive um, with other people, and and Damali and I talk about this all the time. It's that if you are truly aligned with the work that you want to do and and where you want to be, then then it will always flow. And, and, and there will always be work. And it's not to say that there won't be challenges. And it's not to say that, you know, there are some months where, you know, a case doesn't come in and I'm like, is this the end? <laughs> but it always starts up again, you know? And, and you just have, have to persevere, um, as Deborah said. So, um, so yeah, that's, I guess that's, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Thanks, Erin. Um, and is there uh, so so? Would your advice be like when you keep getting told no? You said just just turn just turn it off. So I think that um, the thing that that I did is um, I created what I think of as sort of my own personal board of directors, um, which is like you know the sort of group of mentors, people who I really trust and who I know um, you know have my best interest in, at heart and and who will give me good advice. And so I will, you know, sort of go to those people when, um, and, and I think that that's a, a crucial part of anybody's career development is, is having, you know, not just one mentor, but, but sort of a team of people who come from different practices and different walks of life to help you get through those moments. Could I just add to that? I, I, I think that's absolutely crucial because there are some times when you hear no and, and that you need to hear no. Uh, and and it's, it's really trying to distinguish between a no that really is factually based for you and a no that just is because people don't think it's never been done, done that way or you're too young or you're too this. There's a difference and, 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 uh, and being able to make that distinction, sometimes we're not able to do it ourselves, but it, it's really good to have that board of directors, that, that sounding board where you can go to someone and test the theory 
Uh, and I have done that. And I've had friends, you know, really good friends in the in the field who have said to me, no, that's not the right path. I don't think that's the right path for you for these reasons. And uh, it's, it's not very often that I've heard that, but, but when I hear it from them, I stop and I pay attention. That, that, that's really good advice. So I'm gonna go to Tajay now. Um, I saw you nodding when, when, when Deborah was talking about that personal board of advisors. Did, did, have you created something like that for, for yourself? Um, I, you know, I think I was fortunate to have a, a lot of adults in my life who um, helped me navigate um, the ADR world um, and, and make connections with people who um, I could sort of reach out to and tap into um, just to sort of learn through their experience, right, and be able to make some, some decisions about uh, directions that I go. Um, for me, you know, I, I just look at everything as opportunity in time, right? And so sometimes it's just not the right moment for certain things. Um, I, you know, early 2000s, I remember going into the school districts and, you know, talking about, you know, restorative justice and saying, you know, restorative practices, that's the, that's the wave, that's where we're moving, that's how we shift our community in schools and, um, you know, sit there and I would be, I'd feel so confident about what it is I'm sharing and at the end you'd hear like, yeah, that's not really the direction we wanna go, right? And uh, it sucked, right? <laughs> um, but I have those same school districts calling me now, you know? They're like, yeah, so let's, let's talk about this restorative practices thing again, right? So it just, you know, sometimes it's just not the right time for certain things. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is, is, you know, my sort of struggle early on, um, even though I had a lot of opportunity through the community work that I've always um, been invested in doing, um, when I started to look at, you know, could I, could I have my own practice in mediation um, and ADR, um, I started to realize that there seems to be a lack of access, particularly for people of color, right? And so you look at, um, you look at these uh, um, panels that exist. And one, I didn't know about the panels when I was younger, right? Um, but they're, they're various panels. And um, then you look at who's on the panels and you say, well, how, how do you find out about these panels, right? Like you just don't have the information to know they exist. Um, and then for a lot of young, young uh, people who are looking to get on panels, then you find out, well, you have to have X amount of hours, right? And you have to have experience. And it's like, well, if I don't have the opportunity to gain the experience, then how do I get on these panels? Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why, you know, I truly invest in myself in the community work because, you know, community dispute resolution centers create that opportunity for people. Um, you know, and I often tell young people, if you want to learn whether or not mediation is something you can do, um, or any other process, conflict coaching, restorative practices, you know, any of that stuff. If you want to figure it out, come with us, right? Gain the experience with us. Um, Cause that's where you get the practical experience that you could then use to apply for any panel that you choose um, to be on. Um, the other piece is, um, you know, many of you here are attorneys and I certainly applaud that, but uh, sometimes that's a barrier for people who um, don't come from that, that path, right? Um, I've never had an interest in being an attorney, um, but I've always had an interest in working with people and helping people have difficult conversations, right? Um, and it's beyond mediation. So from that perspective, I get what Peter's saying. Um, look at all the possibilities um, to do this work and figure out how you help people have difficult conversations, because that to me is what it is. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is that um, I don't think people are unwilling to pay for conflict. In fact, if you think about it, we pay for conflict whether we realize it or not, right? Our communities pay for conflict. Our families pay for the conflict that they're in. They may not always see the value in paying for conflict resolution or bringing somebody in, but um, somebody posted in a chat, as long as there are people around, there will always be work and that is true. You know, our job while you're doing the work is to help people realize how important the work is, how beneficial the work is. Um, and so, you know, for me, um, there is plenty of work to be had, but there's also work we need to put in. Um, and while we're doing the work, we have to help people recognize how important this work actually is. Um, and I said it before and I'll say it again, 
we're in probably the most opportune time to push forward ADR, right? Um, and from the community level all the way up. Um, and so creating access for people, particularly young people, is so key and important. Let's get back to our schools. Let's teach young people these skills, right? The more young people learn these skills um, is, uh, is, is our investment in helping adults who utilize the services that we, we uh, put forth. Um, so to me, that's important. Um, one more thing I wanted to, you know, just sort of um, uh, share. Um, I, I think, you know, we have to start to create opportunities for um, people of color much more than we um, have, right? And so that's my biggest investment now. I'm looking at some of the panels that I have as a CDRC and um, I'm, we're not as diverse as we should be. Um, and you know what, shame on me. You know, I've been a director now for five years and um, now I'm looking at it and saying, where have I missed the mark? You know, what am I not doing um, that I need to do a, a bit more of? Um, and so that's a lot of my investment because the, the folks we're working with are diverse, right? They're coming from all different backgrounds and walks of, walk of life. So um, for me, um, my job over the next couple of years is making sure that my panels uh, represent everyone that we serve. Um, and that's the investment that I ask you all, those who are seasoned in the field, those who are coming into the field, um, make sure that that is part of um, the thing that you pull forward as well, ensuring that our panels and the people who do this work represent those who benefit from the work and those who can benefit from the work that we do. So I'll, I'll sort of leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tajay. And I just want to say that um, CPR has been, we developed alternative pathways to our employment arbitration panels. So it's more for the lawyers um, out there. But if you have um, experience as an employment or labor attorney, but not as an arbitrator per se, or the opposite, if you have experience as an arbitrator, but not specifically in the labor and employment area, we have a particular um, program where we, you can come and apply and, and we'll train you to do that. And the whole idea is to expand and diversify uh, our panels. And we're doing that in many other ways. And there's a breakout session on um, different diversity, equity, and inclusion um, efforts that CPR and other organizations are, are doing. So if anyone is interested in continuing that conversation, uh, I encourage you to, to join that breakout session. Um, so, yeah. I just plug also the Metropolitan Black Bar Association's ADR section is also actively trying to move the needle on diversifying mediators in the space. Um, we're working on holding a basic mediation training. One thing that Tajay was alluding to is training to be even become a mediator to break into this space can be very expensive. And when I say expensive, I mean upwards of $2,000 and it requires a commitment of 40 hours to be able to even step foot in the door to get the experience to get where a lot of our panelists are talking about. And so what we're working on is trying to present a very, very low cost option for diverse mediators who want to get um, trained so that it's not so preventative. Um, of course, you have to be a member of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association to take advantage of that or some of our affinity bars, but um, you know, there, there's a lot of good work being done and we do recognize that's a problem, Tajay, indeed. And uh, Professor Homer LaRue posted, thank you so much, um, Professor LaRue. Uh, we, we've been focused a lot, Professor LaRue, uh, through the Ray Corlery Initiative, has been focused a lot on actually getting selected. Um, like as Professor LaRue said, you know, getting on the panels is the first step, but then actually getting selected is, is the second step. And CPR is proud to be working with, with Professor LaRue on the RCI Corollary Initiative, which we can also talk about in the, in the breakout session. Um, so uh, I just wanna go to, to Pete now uh, to hear a little bit uh, about, you know, an example of when you were told no and, and how you overcame that. I'm, 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 I'm still resonating with a lot of what uh, Taja just said. I agree with you. The work is out there. It's everywhere. And the need for what we do is everywhere. But when they say no, we got to look at it as behind every no, there's a maybe, right? How do you get to, if you can't get to the yes, how do you get to the maybe, right? And, and, and perhaps it is timing. That is one thing. Perhaps it is also how do we frame what we're doing differently? Because sometimes we can be very scary in the way we, we're coming across. 
And so we have to look at ourselves to say, wow, what's the impact we're having? And how do we have to kind of retool that um, to make it acceptable, to make it safe, to make it something that is, uh, they'll dip their toe in the water around. Um, so I guess that would be the way I would answer that question. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, so we have about five minutes left. Um, we got a bunch of, of questions in the chat. Um, Lauren, do you do you want to go to do you want to go to questions in the chat now? Um, we can. I think a lot of them have actually been getting answered um, as we've been going. Um, and I think um, what I'll do is I'll pose two questions out there, and the panelists can pick which one you want to answer. Um, all right, so so one is about skill set, actual tangible skill sets that people can apply right now. So the general question, option number one is, for those of us in the audience who are not yet where you are, um, what kind of skills do you think um, we would need to develop? You know, how do you and how do you build those skills? And I guess a sub part of that is, um, how important is it to have the subject matter expertise to get that job as a mediator or an arbitrator? That's option number one. Okay. Question option number two is, can you provide some, some practical advice for our audience members, either the ones that are in law school and are looking for to enter the field, um, for those that are mid-career and are looking for that confidence to change careers, um, or for some of our non-lawyers that want to know, you know, that are getting their master's or they're in law school, what kind of jobs are out there in this space and how do you find those opportunities? So either the advice um, or what are the practical skills that um, those of us that are not yet where you are can capitalize on? Maybe they already exist and we don't know that they're transferable. Like Deborah said, you spent seven years building on these skills. She didn't know it at the time, but maybe if she would have known, she would have been able to more readily identify them. So I'm gonna let whoever wants to unmute themselves first, take a stab at this, just to let you know, timing wise, we have about five minutes left and then it's kind of a hard stop so we can enter our breakout rooms. So everyone kind of gets a minute or so. All right, first person to unmute gets to go. I'll keep an eye and see who that is. Dum, dum, dum. Deborah. I'll go. Okay, so um, I would say the days of when I started in international arbitration, it was, um, it, was, it was not unusual to find people who did not have any language skills. Uh, because it was kind of a uh, American dominated profession and most Americans didn't speak a, another language. I think that th those days are pretty much dead. Now, if you say to yourself, oh my gosh, I wanna do international arbitration and I don't speak a language, I am not saying to you a language other than English. I'm not saying to you, your career is over before it gets started. I'm just telling you that that would be a skill um, that, that it, it would be good to have. But above everything else, you need to have subject matter expertise uh, in international arbitration. And you can get that uh, by wherever you're working, getting becoming the best and the most knowledgeable about a particular area, whether it's a sector, whether it's an industry, or whether it's a new area like business and human rights or climate change. Maybe that's how you can stake out your, uh, your, uh, make yourself appear different because you have expertise in a new area of the law. I would say any area of the law at a certain point, there's going to be conflict and there will be a need for international arbitration. Great, so take away language skills, um, really helpful, probably no matter where you wanna enter, quite frankly, in, in this world, this is a global world, um, but also specifically for international arbitration, subject matter expertise. Um, all right, Dean, I see you're unmuted, you're next. I did unmute because I wanted to share that in terms of being an ombudsman, um, it's not necessarily subject matter expertise that gets you the opportunity. It's more based on your skill set. So I would recommend that people definitely do mediation training because the skills that you learn to become a mediator are ones that you're going to use every day in your career as an ombudsman. Those questions, the clarifying questions, um, really perspective taking and helping somebody open up their horizon are definitely um, skills that you want to have in hand. Definitely want to study some uh, emotional intelligence, EQ. 
um, to really be able to not only be self-aware, because if you're going to be in neutral, you really have to understand when you're going off the path and what that looks like and how to get back on, but also to help your folks who are coming to see you identify how much they know about themselves and what impact either the amount or lack thereof of self-knowledge they have is having on their ability to succeed in the work that they're doing. So um, it's really nice in the ombuds profession that you could serve multiple companies and don't necessarily need to understand their business. They're going to teach you that business by working through them. So it's not so much subject matter focus, it's more skills focused. I think that's really uh, great for people in the audience that are getting exposed to the career of ombuds for the very first time. Um, I think that that's probably uh, exciting that they can maybe access this profession a little bit more than they thought they could. Um, all right, I'm going to just go down my screen to Erin. Either the advice or practical skills that it would take to succeed as either a mediator or an arbitrator. Um, I'll go. I'll go advice. I think. Um, is this general advice? Um, advice. We're looking for advice for either mediators or perhaps maybe we can focus on mid-career changes because that's something that um, that you spoke a bit about you experiencing. You know, um, so when I made the switch initially, when I was still at the Strauss Institute, I've seen a bunch of questions about training in schools. Um, I love Strauss. I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. I thought it was the complete game changer for me and I loved every second of it. Um, it's, it's an investment, that's for sure. Um, for me, it was, it was worth it. Um, you know, when I was there, I made it a part of, you know, I saw school as a job and and part of that job was was networking and so i was constantly talking to my professors about you know who i could talk to i had a list every day of three people that that i would speak to over the course of the year and a half that i think was out there one of whom um, was deborah enix ross and 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 who i remember at the time um, just stood out as as such sort of a beacon of light amidst all of the, um, you know, sort of advice that I got. Because at the time I was telling people that I was at Strauss and, you know, I was hoping to go in-house and, and Deborah, I clearly remember was one of the only people who said to me, if that's what you want to do, then, you know, then you'll make it happen. And, um, and, and that was really just such a wonderful thing to hear. So, um, so anyway, I think that networking is, is super important. Thank you, Deborah. Look at that connections being made, um, you know, that predated the panel and that that is, it brings even more to the importance of connecting in the chat. Um, you know, if you see somebody that's saying something that sounds really interesting to you, feel free to drop your email address, follow up and connect. Because again, remember your network is your net worth and that really applies specifically in the conflict prevention and resolution field. Um, all right, we have two more panelists. We have about two more minutes. So one minute each. Um, Pete, let's, let's hear from you, either the advice for non-lawyers perhaps, um, or some of those tangible skills that people that are not yet where you are, but may aspire to be there can hang on to and can seek to acquire. I think, you know, somebody put in there is subject matter expertise necessary. I, I don't think it ever hurts to have it because it gives you credibility. It gives people a sense of comfort with you. It can also get in your way because it can really put blinders on you about how you think something ought to turn out. So I think once you have the credibility, if you have uh, with subject matter, you're real your real job is to get people through difficult conversations. And what they'll say at the end is it was that skill that really got them over the hump, not your subject matter expertise about that. At least that's my experience. Way to keep that to 60 seconds too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and last but not least, we will hear from Tajay to close us out. Um, I, I think for me, the most important thing is just develop your artistry right? Invest the time and energy um, that's needed to develop your ability to do what you do and do it well, right? Because if you don't do it well, you don't get more opportunities, right? People aren't going to hire you. Um, but if you invest the right level of time, energy, um, you'll develop and you'll be very good at what it is you do. And that's how you build your practice, right? Um, you know, I'm a strong believer in, in being a reflective practitioner, um, every mediation I do, every conference I hold, every uh, community dialogue um, project I have, you know, I sit at the end and I say what worked, 
right? What was difficult for me? What do I need to do different next time? Um, and so, you know, by doing that, I'm able to um, strategically think about how I improve every time I do the work I do. Um, and so I would sort of suggest that as what everybody should be doing, right? Develop your artistry. And when you develop your artistry, you will become very good at what it is you do. That's it for me. And I think that's a perfect, perfect reflection to end, um, to end our discussion on. Um, on behalf of myself and Anna, um, we'd like to thank the entire panel and everyone for attending and especially to our co-sponsors. Um, we are getting ready to transition to breakout rooms. I really hope you'll stay with us. We still have just about a hundred people here. Um, in order to make the networking portion more meaningful, we have pre-selected topics for each breakout session based on the topics the attendees said they were most interested in hearing about. Yeah, and each breakout session will have a facilitator to help guide the discussion, share their expertise and answer questions. So, you know, everyone should feel comfortable. It's just gonna be really kind of just very casual. Um, so for those of you who get a little bit nervous about networking, just this is gonna be super easy. So just, you know, if you're interested, please do come.